اسلام Hi, I'm Manon Herzog with Polyplexus. Welcome to the third episode of Talk Polymath. As the New York Times recently put it, an oily 100 nanometer white bubble of genes has killed more than 2 million people and reshaped the world. No wonder virus is a Latin term for poison. And while we all feel intimately familiar with the impact of COVID-19, there is so much more to know, as we will learn from our guests in the next hour. Speaking of guests, for today's episode, we are joined by Krista Millich, a biological anthropologist who teaches at Washington University in St. Louis and does field research primarily in Africa and South America. Krista will be in dialogue with Steve Morse, a professor of epidemiology at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Steve also served as a program manager for biodefense at DARPA. But before we start, a little background on Polyplexus. We are a platform that hosts evidence-based conversations with purpose. We connect a community of cross-disciplinary researchers like Krista and Steve with sponsors who are interested in exploring big issues, problem framing, funding, and innovation. It's free to join, and we hope you will check out the many conversations on the platform. Now, Krista and Steve, over to you for what promises to be a fascinating discussion Please take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here tonight and uh, to join Krista as a dialogue, as a duo talking about the life of coronaviruses and other zoonotic infections. Zoonotic infections are those that naturally transmit from other animals to humans. But um, all of this seems very exotic. You're going to hear a lot about the coronaviruses, but you've already heard a lot about the coronaviruses. So I think tonight you're going to hear a different take on where the coronaviruses come from and uh, what they've been doing, uh, mostly unnoticed by us until very recently. And the coronavirus also, all these coronaviruses that we're talking about tonight uh, are really perfect exemplars of what we would call an emerging infection. And there are many of these throughout history. Think of the Black Death in the 14th century, but we've been seeing more and more of them recently. Um, HIV, I think, called our attention to the fact that the uh, infectious diseases were not just a thing of the past, as we hoped. But what do we mean by an emerging infection? Those are infections that aren't the Andromeda strain. There are lots of movies about those. Unlike the movies, these are more like maybe the movie Contagion. These are infections that are rapidly increasing in incidence, that is the number of new cases, or geographic range. That's something that you know, is, we define as emerging. Very often these are novel um, and previously unrecognized. And most of these are zoonotic. As I mentioned, they come from other species. And you'll hear a lot about this tonight. Also, ironically, we have met the enemy and sometimes it's us because very often anthropogenic causes are important in emergence. They're the reason that these infections that are natural infections of other species actually suddenly appear from out of nowhere, but not out of nowhere, out of somewhere out of our contacting some species that carried these infections as their own natural infection. And now there's the opportunity for human beings to become infected. So coronaviruses have um, of zoonotic origin have emerged three times in the last three decades, almost clock-like precision, 2003, 2012, and now again in uh, 2019, 2020. And uh, for many people, you know, we think about coronaviruses, we think about 
uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 and the disease it causes, COVID-19 uh, coronavirus disease 2019, as the WHO, World Health Organization, called it. Those of us who are of a certain age remember the SARS outbreak of 2003. But actually, coronaviruses, as you'll hear from uh, Krista, have been circulating and have been with us for a long time, even in the human population, let alone in other species. And uh, we've really very much taken them for granted. Before 2003, with SARS, which suddenly made people interested in the human diseases caused by coronaviruses, we pretty much ignored them. And uh, more or less by accident in the 1960s onwards, human coronaviruses were discovered. There are four that we know about, although there may be a number of others that have been uh, alluded to in the literature, but never really followed up on. So um, those coronaviruses were thought of as being pretty trivial. For human um, medicine people, human virologists, basically they were the cause of a common cold or flu-like illness, some, something like that. And we really took them for granted. And then of course, um, these human coronaviruses uh, which we took for granted for a long time are circulating and are still with us today every winter, maybe not so much this winter because of all the precautions. Hopefully we've all been taking against uh, the SARS coronavirus too. But then the world changed in 2003 with the original SARS coronavirus suddenly being found in humans. And now we know there are coronaviruses as we've always known, as the veterinarians have always known. Um, coronaviruses and other species as well. Um, Chris has been studying these for quite some time and is an expert on this, on this part of the coronavirus life cycle. Yeah, I mean, you know, the big thing with the recent outbreaks for SARS and our, our current pandemic is that people are thinking a lot about bats as the reservoir of these coronaviruses. Um, and certainly there we have now after SARS discovered a lot of coronaviruses in bats, but actually we've known about coronaviruses in other species for a long time. Um, avian infectious bronchitis is an issue that's been a huge problem for poultry farmers for decades. I think it was first discovered in the 1930s. Uh, and you know, there's been a lot of effort to try and control it and manage it though there are variants that pop up um, in different farming populations that cause problems for controlling it. Um, and it's, it's not just poultry, you know, there's, if, if you have cats, you may have heard of feline infectious peritonitis that is actually caused by a feline coronavirus. Um, and there are a lot of, of other coronaviruses in domesticated animals also. If we look at a, a phylogenetic tree or, you know, a list of the known coronaviruses, there is a, a part of it that is bats and also a part of it that's humans, but actually they just make up a fraction of the total list because we actually know of a lot of coronaviruses in other animals. Some of these are other wild species like civets, which you may have heard about particularly during the 2003 SARS outbreak. Um, but a lot of them are also domesticated animals. So things like rabbits and turkeys, um, cows, pigs, horses, there are coronaviruses for all of these different species. And what happens is that those can then pass into humans. So we know um, that there are different coronaviruses that are circulating in our population, as Steve was mentioning, that actually come from these domesticated animals and that we've been dealing with for a long time. Um, so I think it's kind of fascinating now that we're in this current situation to think about what it was like when those first made that leap into human populations, um, you know, thinking about if there was a big outbreak like there is right now or what it would have looked like at that time. What do you think about that, Steve? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great question because we really don't know. None of us were there at the time, just like most of us no longer were, were there in the great influenza of 1918. 
so we have to rely on historical records. And of course, we don't have um, molecular uh, evidence uh, at this stage. But it is quite interesting, I think, that there are a lot of coronaviruses in these other species. We've taken the hum human coronaviruses for granted, but in fact, they were first discovered almost accidentally when uh, June Almeida and colleagues in um, the UK in the 1960s were looking at some uh, cells from um, people who had uh, children who had coughs and things like that, bronchitis, and found particles that looked just like uh, the, the chicken coronavirus, the avian infectious bronchitis virus, and wondered about that and then began, began to characterize them more. But what seems clear is that most of these human circulating coronaviruses not only closely resemble these others, they probably came from the same sources. We just really don't know because we weren't there. For example, one thing we do know is that the commonest uh, human coronavirus that we know of o called OC43, which again, we all take for granted, is very closely related to the bovine coronavirus. And people have speculated that it may have been introduced into the human population from people taking care of cattle and getting it from their livestock. And uh, where that happened and when that happened, we don't know. Those who do molecular studies suggest the late 19th century. And I thought coronaviruses in humans would be older than that, but it turns out they came in at different times and some of them may not have been that ancient. And that may have happened in Central Asia. Some people think that what we felt was a, that what most of us believe is a flu pandemic in the late 19th century may have been the original outbreak of this coronavirus, in which case it probably would have looked an awful, like, uh, an awful lot like what we're all living through now, which I think is really pretty amazing. And I think it also proves that, you know, if you look at the distribution of these viruses and their natural hosts, they're all over the world. So, you know, we know with something like a pandemic, certainly like the SARS coronavirus too, we know certainly that um, it is all over the world and we need to protect people and prevent its transmission all over the world, or we're going to be seeing, you know, this coming back again and again, and we still might, but um, we don't know if someday it'll tame down to become another OC43. I, I may not live to see it, I don't know. In the meantime, it's causing plenty of, of trouble. Um, Absolutely. We and I don't think, know the timeline for that. Yeah. And I, I think that point you made about, um, you know, the fact that this is all over the, these, these transmissions can happen all over the world. And also that it's not just a certain type of animal or a certain place on the globe where we have to be concerned about it. I think that's really important for the type of, of discourse that we're having right now. Oh, oh yes. And, uh, you know, sometimes we, we think we're in a bubble here, but maybe we, we are, you know, when we try to protect ourselves against the coronavirus. I know that one of the listeners sent in a question asking about uh, the diversity of coronaviruses, but not just that, all the different variants we're seeing and lineages that we're seeing. And all that started from one virus and um, that was described first in, in China. We are, are still debating where it may have come from originally, but presumably bats, presumably through the live animal markets, which is what we know happened with, with the original SARS coronavirus. And this SARS coronavirus too has diversified as it's gone through the human population. Essentially Darwinian evolution has given it all kinds of uh, various mutations have collected that have given the virus the ability to spread more readily. And of course that's selected by Darwinian evolution. And I know that basically if it has a fitness advantage, it's selected for. And so some of the early mutants displace the original strain, which you really can't find in nature anymore. It's been displaced by some of these other, you know, apparent variants. So there are so many unknowns there. What do you think about the uh, animals that perhaps could be future reservoirs as well as the current reservoirs of of the coronavirus is. Yeah, that, that's a big concern in my field. Um, we've seen some examples of SARS-CoV-2 being transmitted 
from humans to other animals. Um, and what that means for those other animals and for us is very concerning um, because, you know, that cycle can just continue. And in other animals, it could also cause die-offs that are, are really dangerous. You may have seen in the New York Times, um, they had an article titled, and then the, the gorillas, started, I think, uh, and it was about the gorillas at the San Diego Zoo that did get infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this is something that we're really worried about where I work um, with wild primates. There are a lot of endangered species that we potentially could pass COVID to, and then those animals could get sick and start transmitting it among themselves, um, and we could see die-offs of other species as a result of that, which is obviously really concerning. Um, the other option is also that uh, in addition to them dying off, or maybe rather than them dying off, they could become reservoirs. And, you know, these, exactly as you're talking about the Darwin oh, yeah. um, evolution and the potential for mutations, the more opportunities the virus has to spread, the more likely we are to see these different variants. And that becomes even more concerning when we see that they could potentially pass into other species, mutate within that other species, and then trans, tra uh, transmit back to humans. Um, for example, uh, where I work in, in Uganda, uh, in the forest there, there have been a, a few examples over the past decade of fairly common um, human respiratory viruses passing into the chimpanzee community. And over the years, several chimpanzees have died because of these various respiratory illnesses that for the most part are really common in humans. So even things that become common in us or that we eventually you know, have, a, have normally circulating in our population can be quite dangerous to other animals. Um, at the same time though, as I mentioned, they could also become reservoirs. That's something that we see, for example, with yellow fever virus in um, monkeys in South America. You have sometimes these die-offs of howler monkeys, for example, a lot of people know howler monkeys because they're so loud and easy to recognize. Uh, um, so there's been die-offs uh, of howler monkeys because of yellow fever virus, but at the same time, non-human primates in the wild are part of the normal cycle of yellow fever virus that infects humans. So this is actually very concerning, not only for us, but also for other species, yeah. and then even beyond that, for it coming back into us. Um, and, you know, we, we heard about this happening already with farmed mink. Uh, you know, there was this outbreak of, there was a transmission event from humans to mink in farms, um, and then it spread between the mink and apparently mutated because then later, humans that were on those farms were found to have a new variant of SARS-CoV-2 that was associated with the mink. Um, so it led to, you know, the need to um, dispose of a bunch of mink that were infected, and it also led to this new variant in humans. So I think that it's something that we really need to be concerned about and be thinking carefully um, about these these interactions. That's, for example, one of the reasons why for me and a lot of my colleagues, we've had our research in the wild on hold for this whole time because of concerns about how to safely go about this for the good of other species and also for our own good. Um, I'm sure that that mink example must be a real concern for epidemiologists like yourself. Oh, I, I think it, it should be for all of us. But what do you think is the possibility if we get this under control and it becomes at, at some point domesticated, but let's say we're talking about uh, vaccines right now. And once enough people get vaccinated, you know, we have the fabled herd immunity where you have so many people, so much of the population vaccinated that they're really no longer uh, susceptible people for the virus to infect. So it kind of dies out. And uh, maybe, you know, we're hoping at some point it would just sort of die out when we uh, control it through something like immunization and all these other non-pharmaceutical measures. So what do you think, given, you know, that it's already in mink, what, what do you think is going to happen with this virus once we get it under control in the human population? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess part of the, the answer to that depends on what under control means, right? Because yeah. we 
get it under to control to the point that we're not actually still transmitting it, that's different than have it under control. Like we reach what you were talking about with OC43, where it basically becomes part of our normal illness, but we don't get really, really ill from it. Yeah. Um, because, you know, in the latter situation, we would still then have the ability to transmit it to a lot of other species. The good news about those gorillas at San Diego is that they recovered. So perhaps yeah. we don't need to be as worried about it as we are. Uh, there are also some, you know, I, I know you've talked before about uh, how how great it is to be able to look at ACE2 variants for yeah. coronavirus because it gives us a really good idea of what other species could potentially be infected. And there's a lot of work being done on that right now with primates to try and figure out which ones should we actually be very concerned about. Um, it's But it's hard because just like the example with the chimpanzee yeah. Kibali, there are there are diseases that we've gotten used to, so to speak, yeah. um, that are still quite deadly. Yeah, and I understand that, as a matter of fact, they were vaccinating some uh, black-footed ferrets, which is an endangered species uh, in the United States, against this coronavirus, because they thought, like the mink and like ferrets, it, they too could become infected. And if they really got sick, you know, it could wipe out the population. I, th I thought that was interesting. They were probably the first ones to get the vaccine, actually, <laughs> and they yeah. survived. Yes, good point. <laughs> um, good, good vaccine advocacy. Yeah, yeah. They got the vaccine and they survived. Yeah, I mean, they actually have given the vaccines now to some of the non-human primates um, at zoos also to try and prevent this very thing from happening. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I think the reality is like you were talking about before how our activities as humans have put so much stress on our own health and the health of other species, you know, and of course it's all connected in that one yeah. approach where if we're not, if the environment is unhealthy and other species are unhealthy, then we're gonna be unhealthy. So we do really need to be concerned about the health of not just ourselves, but also other species in the environment. Um, and we've gotten to a, a point where some species, like, like you were mentioning black-footed ferrets, we have species that are um, so endangered that we do have to do some amount of management, even of wild populations, for them to have any chance in this world where humans are doing so much damage. So I see that also with some wild species of non-human primates where there's really just so few left that a lot of effort has to be put in um, to keeping them alive, unfortunately. And I hope that this, this pandemic has brought some more awareness to how we are making ourselves sick by making the earth sick and, and maybe we'll, we'll be able to adjust our relationship with nature because of that. Um, but it is a concern. And, you know, it, when we think of other pandemics, these diseases that have such a negative effect on us also have a negative effect on other animals. E the Ebola outbreak, obviously Ebola is something terrifying for humans. It's also uh, led to the death of many gorillas. So these, you know, if, if we have a negative impact, it can also impact other species and um, it's bad all around. So we have to remember to be good stewards of the environment. And uh, people talk about the One Health concept, which I think we're trying to exemplify here today, that, that really we're all inextricably linked and interdependent, and, and that uh, we may not appreciate that. But those bats we've been talking about do a lot of ecological services. They do a lot of things that even people would appreciate like eating insects and uh, yes. all those other things, pollinating certain, um, certain plants. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, some people have said, you know, so should we just get rid of bats because of this? And yeah. goodness, no, because you know what else spreads diseases? Mosquitoes, which yeah. bats eat. So, you know, we, we, we can't manage our way out of this, I don't think. I don't yeah. think it's a matter of doing more harm to the environment. I think it's about reconsidering how we can do less yeah. harm. Um, and I know, I, you know, you've, you've had so many incredible experiences traveling and studying these, these issues all around the world. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of examples of that. Well, I think we both have, and you, you've been in Uganda more recently than I have. I re remember in Queen Elizabeth Park in Uganda, there's a group of chimpanzees that's completely separated. 
and really not self-sustaining because they're separated from other chimpanzee troops and there's a road that actually separates them from many of their food sources. So it's really more a tourist attraction. And I remember last time I was, I was in Uganda some years ago when they discovered oil in Queen Elizabeth Park, which is a natural forest reserve. So I wonder what happened there and you know, whether there was good environmental stewardship after that. You've been in Uganda more recently. How did that work out? Yeah, <laughs> put me on the spot here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's always complicated. Um, I think that a lot of people are trying their best to keep to keep the animals and the parks protected. You know, the Ugandan Wildlife Authority um, works very hard to protect the wildlife in Uganda. And there are many researchers and also community members that, that recognize the value of that wildlife and work really hard, especially collaboratively. Um, a lot of the work that I do is collaborative work with community members there. Um, and I think people are being very innovative about how to come up with these sustainable solutions with that said, there are still yeah. other forces that are at play that, you know, do do make it um, a little concerning. Just in the time that I've worked in Uganda, I've seen a huge shift. Uh, you know, there's paved roads around Kivali National Park now, which there, there used to be not many paved roads, as I'm sure you remember. Um, yeah. And yeah, the infrastructure has just grown a lot. And you know that infrastructure is there in order to be able to remove natural resources. Yeah. I think that it's something that we have to continue to keep an eye on. And you know, I always, I always like to think about the fact that even these things that are happening far away, they're happening because of global economic drivers, right? So we very much are a part of what's happening um, that then leads to these increases in interactions between humans and, and other animals, and ultimately then feeds back into this, this loop of zoonotic disease transmission. And that's why we've seen with over the decades, the more, I mean, you've written about this, you know better than I do, the, the more human activity we have, um, the increase in emerging infectious diseases each decade. So uh, yeah, it continues to be a concern. Yeah, and uh, well, you've seen it up, up front too, you know, really up close. And, uh, you know, we talk about anthropogenic causes, you know, of course, very often they're the result of good intentions, trying to clear the land for agriculture so that people can have more food, but that, you know, can have negative effects if we don't think about it. And then of course, the invention of the airplane has now made it possible for a coronavirus to spread worldwide. I don't know what happened in the 19th century with, you know, when maybe the bovine coronavirus became a human coronavirus, OC43, but it probably took longer. I know certainly in 1918, it took a couple of years for the virus to spread for the influenza virus of 1918, a different virus, but still similar uh, lifestyle to spread around the world. Um, and in, in a few places, it, it took several years to get there. And this is now happening much faster. And I, I guess there will be another one in the future. And uh, that will be faster too. Yeah. And I think, you know, even I can't go back all the way to OC43, but yeah, nor can I. SARS in 2003, I even think there must be such huge differences in our, our travel patterns and interaction patterns now um, compared to 20 years ago, because obviously the asymptomatic spread of COVID has complicated things a lot, but um, it's, it's amazing how I mean, there's a lot of reasons for this, but SARS was contained in a way that we just totally lost control of in this pandemic. Yeah, that's interesting. I think we perhaps gained a sense of false confidence with SARS because, you know, SARS was spread mostly through the healthcare setting. And so it was really a matter of improving infection control. There were a couple of mass exposures which probably occurred 
via the respiratory route, at least people getting infected via the respiratory route, the virus may very well, the SARS virus may very well have gotten out through the intestines where, where it also replicates. And indeed we see this one do it too, but uh, it, it didn't do much transmission person to person by the respiratory route. It was close contact with aerosols. It was other things that happened mostly in hospitals. And so it was the healthcare worker. And then, of course, once you got that under control, you could have um, really say uh, you could really say SARS is gone because it was, you know, it was just in a few little pockets, mostly hospitals and MERS, which is still with us. The Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus started in 2012 in the Middle East, which proves these things can be anywhere. Who would have expected something like an infectious disease problem in the Middle East to you know, take our attention away from all the political problems there, which still exist, but MERS still exists. And it's almost entirely through the healthcare associated setting. Uh, and if uh, that were completely, if it were possible to completely um, close that to breaches and mistakes, then you'd have a few primary cases who'd come in every so often, but th there are not that many of them. And um, some of them apparently um, seem to be associated with camels, about half of them. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I was, I was gonna ask you, why do you think it is that we don't continue to see SARS cases, but we do continue to see MERS cases? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. It, it turns out that people think that SARS essentially disappeared from uh, nature, at least they haven't re-isolated, they haven't found it again. And I think it may be very much like what happened here. You know, what happened here is you had the original virus, whatever it was that got into people and was reported in Wuhan. And then a variant, a particular mutant, D614G, which could, um, could transmit much better, very quickly uh, emerged and displaced it, which, which we see with influenza all the time after a pandemic too. And then other um, mutations built on that building block and, it, and you have this big tree now of all these different, sort of like an upside down uh, phylogenetic tree, you know, the root uh, with that one virus that's become all these other things and all these other variants, some of them even going into mink and being isolated there. And I wonder if, you know, maybe the SARS virus is still out there in nature, maybe just its descendants are, because as you know, when they look for the SARS uh, virus in these same bats, the horseshoe bats, they found dozen, you know, maybe a dozen other closely related viruses. And, and many of them seemed like they would be uh, much more capable of infecting humans. They had a better fit with the receptor. So what do you think is still out there? I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I think that that bit about how after SARS, then we, we went looking for coronavirus yeah. and bats, right? And when we went looking, we found a bunch yeah. of things. And that's why we now know that there are a variety of coronaviruses and bats. But, um, you know, to your point, just the, the idea that there has to be an opportunity for this to get yeah. into humans. And if it's out there, this is one thing I try and I try and say to people when I'm working with with people in the places that I work, you know, if you don't interact with it, then it can be, and it's not going to, it's not going to be a problem for you. Um, but there were other coronaviruses that seemed like they would have been uh, more likely to transmit to humans than, than SARS yeah. was. Um, and yet they didn't, probably because they didn't have the opportunity, right? So uh, I, I'm sure, uh, yeah, like you're saying, I'm sure that there are still um, a lot out there that we don't even know about, uh, and new variants, of course, can can crop up all the time. Um, but again, if we if we find ways to limit the the impact of humans needing to be in such yeah. contact with other animals, you know, the the again, just those global economic forces that are that are causing massive habitat loss and putting bats roosting right over farmland. It's yeah. a really bad, I mean, you know, we saw that with Nipah virus. Yeah. That's, that's a terrible way um, to be interacting with the world. And then we end up in this situation where uh, 
we, we have the opportunity for viruses, maybe even if they're not the best fit virus yeah. to, to a human, because they have the opportunity, they take it. Yeah, and um, I, I think opportunity is very important there. It's not just the biological capability it has to be there. I mean, Ebola has had a number of opportunities, but you know, we saw so many cases of Ebola in 2014, not because it was more transmissible, people speculated, but it wasn't. It still you know, didn't transmit that well, but people were very close together. And so that gave the opportunity for a lot of transmission in cities. And it's surprising, you know, how many failures of imagination when you think about, you know, what's out there and how uh, we knew all about these coronaviruses. Well, something about these coronaviruses. Veterinarians had seen them for years. And yet um, we uh, didn't act as if we expected this to transmit like the flu, actually a little better than the flu, I think, from what we now know, from person to person, but so many other coronaviruses did that. Um, I sometimes wonder if that was a failure of imagination or just kind of the ostrich. Do ostriches really stick their head in the sand? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but uh, you know, I, I sometimes think it's more like an avoidance, a denial phenomenon, you know, that we knew it was happening, but we didn't think we should or could do anything about it. We could spend a lot of time thinking about how to prevent things like influenza pandemics and even smallpox uh, back after 9-11, you know, and a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, and yet none of it uh, was actually used when the time came, uh, you yeah. know, which, which, which is, I, I think, an interesting problem. There must be I know there are a lot of coronaviruses out there, but people always say, you know, well, why didn't we predict, you know, we predict, we, we worried about pandemic influenza, you know, why didn't we worry about coronaviruses becoming a pandemic? But then nobody thought that HIV was, was out there. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I, to put a positive spin on it, I will say, I think that the groundwork that was laid in vaccine preparation or getting the technology and the scientific information for developing vaccines. I think that's one way that we saw all of this work that goes into planning behind the scenes yeah. but in the midst of a pandemic, like that really can pay off when something um, happens. And to your point, there are a lot of other well-researched and well-thought-out plans yeah should have been able to, to be, you know, utilized in this moment that didn't, but um, at least we're, I, I really think, you know, the, that the vaccine development, I think is such a, a great example of how just rigorous science all the time does actually yeah. really help us when, when something serious happens and we need to know what's going on. I mean, yeah, it, it's a, miracle that we, it's not a miracle. It's great scientific work that we, we have the vaccines. Yeah. That we have. No, that, no, I, I, I agree with you completely that, that it was really a, really an amazing thing that a vaccine could be developed and also these new vaccine platforms that were really uh, amazing, but that there had really been no incentive to develop them commercially, you know, simply because uh, that, vaccines that already existed, were already approved. It's pretty expensive to introduce a new vaccine unless there's a real need. Uh, they tried to make a, a SARS vaccine and then SARS went away. So all the companies stopped doing it. Uh, Zika, I don't know where we are with that one. Maybe that'll be a new RNA vaccine, but all these new platforms finally got a chance. Maybe that's Darwinian too. They finally had the selective advantage and had a chance to get expressed. I agree, that's a really an amazing thing. And, and that we're now using advanced mRNA technologies and things to get our daily, when we can get them, get our vaccines that uh, you know, we, we never even dreamt of when I was working at DARPA or when you know, other people we, we know were working on these things. Yeah. So that is a good thing. What about diagnostics? We, uh, I think that was one of the areas we still are way behind. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I, I think some interesting work, I'm sure you can answer this question better than I can. Some interesting work has come out of that. I think um, one thing in terms of just continuing to do this, this research and, and lay the groundwork um, is that I think for the type of work that I do, trying to understand what's 
in other species mm -hmm. circulating in wildlife, what species serve as reservoirs of different things. I think that that's really important. I mean, obviously I'll take this minute to just plug that. Mm -hmm. that we, should be, um, we should be monitoring other animals. That's what I do in my work. You know, when humans brought Zika virus to the mm -hmm. Americas, we suddenly had a virus that was very similar to yellow fever virus being introduced. Mm -hmm to a whole bunch of non-human primates that had never been in contact with it before, right? And we can just yeah. assume that there would be an event in which humans passed it um, once it arrived in the Americas to, to non-human primates. So I spent uh, a year before the pandemic traveling around to different places uh -huh. in South America and in Mexico, collecting a bunch of samples from lots of different non-human primates to try and figure out in what geographic locations do we potentially see reservoirs and in which species do we potentially see reservoirs? Because even something like yellow fever virus, I mentioned that it we have howler monkey die-offs because of it, but it doesn't kill every non-human primate that it infects. Some of them seem to really not be affected by it. Um, so potentially we could have you know, viruses yeah. circulating in populations and them not having any symptoms from it. Um, so, you know, I think that that sort of that sort of research, collecting samples and trying to, non-invasively, I don't kill animals in this research. Um, we do all non-invasive work and, and that also helps push the diagnostics, right? I, I have a paper where um, we, we validated a method for detecting Zika virus in feces so that I can collect feces without ever interacting with the animals um, and, and figure out if they, have, if they have Zika virus or not. Uh, and I think that that sort of work, just continuously putting in the effort on that sort of work lays the foundation so that hopefully we can continue to have better diagnostics in the future. But I think you yeah. really know better about, about potential diagnostic um, advancements for humans. Well, we both worked in this area, as you know, the USAID, the Agency for International Development, our, um, our foreign aid agency, uh, about 12 years ago now decided to start a, a new program or a new project called PREDICT, uh, which was um, you know, part of their effort to find and deal with emerging pathogens. That actually came out of their concern about H5N1, the avian influenza, that showed up at about the same time, coincidentally, as SARS in different places. Some of the same places too, come to think of it. But you know, the PREDICT project was doing just the same thing uh, you're doing, going out and looking at uh, you know, various wildlife species and, and using uh, molecular uh, methods to fairly broad based molecular methods like uh, generic family, viral family PCRs and things like that to try to find both known and unknown um, viruses and other pathogens in these species. And my colleagues used to tease me about that since I was the co-director for the first five years. They used to say, when are you going to predict something? And of course, it was an aspirational name, but I think it's a, you know, I think we both have the same situation. We know there are a lot of things out there and, you know, which, of, which will be the lucky for them and unlucky for us, the lucky few uh, that, that actually make it as this one did, and they're pretty rare, but every so often one gets through like this particular uh, pandemic. And, uh, you know, really knowing what to do about that. And of course they evolve too, as you point out. So, uh, you know, finding, certainly as you say, the interface is really important. If there aren't people there, then I guess it's like the proverbial tree that falls in the forest, you know, nobody hears it. That's but right. um, we're, we seem to be everywhere now. I mean, we're major, you know, there are places we haven't yet gotten to, but, you know, we're major influences on the environment and environmental change. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult um, situation that we're in now. And, uh, you know, I, I am encouraged by um, especially young people's approach to this. I think that they're just so progressive when it comes to recognizing these issues. I mean, they, we've just had a, a bunch of young people have their, you know, their ability to interact with their university classmates, yeah. high school classmates, or their childhood friends for a year. And I think that yeah. they're feeling very passionate about changing the directory, yeah. trajectory of how we're handling these things. And, and people have talked about the Fauci phenomenon that, you know, 
uh, Anthony Fauci, Tony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH, you know, has been, he's a great scientific communicator and he's been on quite a lot trying to convey the science, which has gotten some people who don't believe this is a thing, you know, angry, but a lot of people really excited about, you know, getting into science. So we're seeing more people applying to our School of Public Health. And I agree with you. I think the hope has to be for the young and certainly my generation, you know, we've, we've left a big mess, but uh, not intentionally, but it seems, you know, so you and, and your students and, you know, my students, uh, all, all of those after us will, will have a, a lot of work ahead of them. Um, but I, I like the point you make about, you know, you made a number of, I think, you know, really, really important points, um, you know, about that um, these have been opportunities to really expand our horizons, and I hope we learn something about it. I mean, you know, one thing we've been discussing is how there's kind of a great circle, not a great chain, but a great circle of being, so these viruses aren't just staying on their own, but they, they come from one species to another. They may then go to other species where they may stay or move on. And you know the same thing, as you know, the same thing happened in 1918 with the influenza, where this has been documented with every influenza pandemic. We probably got it from pigs, but then we gave it right back to them when we got infected. And the same thing happened in 2009. The, we don't know exactly what the 2009 virus in pigs looked like during that pandemic because most of the people threw away their samples. They didn't want anyone to know. No, seriously, uh, the few samples that were in the public domain suddenly disappeared. So really? we, couldn't, we couldn't analyze them, yeah. But the ones that uh, after the pandemic were all, all looked like, human, like the human um, nine, uh, 2009 virus. You know, so I hope we have some old samples to look at from the pigs and figure out what it looked like before it got into us, but it probably looks. So there's a, a circle that keeps going on and on involving several species. Yeah, absolutely. I noticed that we have a, a question from someone um, who's asking about the viral equivalent to antibiotic resistant bacteria and asking if that is potentially a public health threat. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, well. Um, actually, actually um, I, uh, I, I was going to ask uh, what you thought, because I think there's certainly a lot of viruses out there and we're selecting for those that can evade the immune system. I mean, you know, that's what seasonal influenza when it picks up all these mutations is all about. That's what all these variants are all about. And, uh, and we have seen you know, we haven't had many antivirals. We have seen resistance. It's it just the bacteria have been, you know, we've been using the antibiotics for so long. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same selective process, right? I mean, yeah. antibiotic resistant bacteria are just the result of a selective process in which the ones that were resistant survived and made it through to the other side. So, I mean, it's just as likely that the same, that yeah. process is happening all the time with viruses. Um, and so, yeah, when you put pressure, when you put pressure on something that's a selective force and then natural selection uh, results in evolution where you see this change in allele frequencies such that you end up with yeah. a population that is then resistant to whatever that selective pressure was that you put on it. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one reason not to, not to say the thing that everybody always says, but that's one reason why I think even with the vaccine rollout, yeah. we're masks, keeping your distance, avoiding gatherings. It's so important because we really want to, it's, it's, a, it's a combined um, effort, right? Where all of these things are needed to actually get to where we want to be because those, those selective pressures, I think for me, they are a concern. Yeah, no, uh, definitely agreed. And I think with all the variants that we see, you know, that's the result, obviously, of the virus replicating and then spreading to new hosts. And the more virus, the more opportunities for new variants. And, you know, it's kind of an arms race, forgive the pun, uh, of getting the vaccine before we have variants that uh, can evade it. And I don't know which will win out. Uh, one of my mentors from... Uh, 
years back, Joshua Letterberg used to say it was our wits versus their genes, but I think they seem to have very, very nimble evolutionary uh, potential. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing another question here that I think is a great one for you. We were talking about predict um, and how you didn't actually predict yeah. <laughs> anything. And this, this question is asking, um, how do you monitor and predict those that will become human? It says, given the number of viruses moving across species, yeah. how do you monitor and predict those that will become human pathogens? And while I, I realize you didn't actually mm. <laughs> predicting one, what, what was the basis for how you would decide which one might, might move into becoming a human pathogen? Oh, that, that's really hard because I mean, I think there are some, and I'd be interested in your thoughts because you, you know, have, have seen this process up close, but, you know, we know that um, there are a lot out there and there needs to be an interface. So people have to be there to get it or something, you know, it has to be a bridge to uh, getting that infection into humans, if in fact it can infect humans. And then I think the hardest thing you know, has always been transmissibility, predicting transmissibility. That, that's that been a real, really a hard thing with things like the influenza viruses, where they had to do these notorious experiments, the so-called gain of function experiments in the lab to try to figure out, you know, whether H5N1, the avian flu, could somehow mutate into a human, maybe pandemic flu, it would be pandemic if it spread person to person. I don't think we're good at that. The coronaviruses actually may be easier to predict because the, their main limitation is receptor specificity and a couple of other things. But most viruses are, are much more you know, compact and all these features, all their uh, genetic features are interrelated. So it's really hard to predict what it takes to be transmissible. And very often, you know, as you know, a lot of viruses will grow very well in human cells uh, or, or primate cells, we grow them all the time and these, uh, these uh, immortalized lines of green monkey, African green monkey kidney cells that were made years and years back, you know, and they're very useful, but uh, that very often they still don't infect people. In fact, we have lots of viruses that grow awfully well in these uh, non-human primate cell lines, even in human cell lines but they don't infect people. We don't see them in people. We can't find them. So I think that's, that was still you know, a hard question for us and the coronaviruses maybe are one of the easier ones. Um, I know that uh, one of our listeners um, had, had asked about, one of the audience had, had asked about inferring the likelihood of transmissibility in humans through analysis of changes in the viral genome. I know that's an area we're both very interested in. And, um, you know, that's a, a really interesting, but very hard question. I think that um, one thing we certainly need to do that. I mean, I, I'll put in a plug for surveillance, but also genomic surveillance and genetic surveillance, because all of these variants we, identified were more or less found by accident. Someone happened to sequence some positive PCR samples from patients, or someone happened to find it in a database, which is interesting that they're actually sequenced in databases. And most of these mutations really are, you know, not of uh, great significance, at least to us, in changing the properties of the virus in any way we can discern. But every so often, something like you know, changing the, the uh, receptor specificity or making the receptor fit better or perhaps uh, not react with certain uh, compounds like antibodies or something like that, like the things we might make when we get vaccinated. You know, those are important properties we have to pay attention to. Uh, so we definitely need to do that. Um, I think coronaviruses maybe are easier to predict than some of the others once they get started. I don't know if anyone could have predicted this in advance. And I, I'd be interested in your thoughts about, also about you know, the uh, changes in the genome and uh, what we might be able to infer about transmissibility. Yeah, I think that's a really hard one um, because like you were saying, we only find that when we actually check for it. And it feels to me like one of the issues has been that some um, systems have been so overwhelmed just dealing with basic testing and, and you know, sorting through the number of patients that they have 
um, that there hasn't been that that extra step to actually look at the genetic code. Um, and once you do start looking, then you suddenly realize like, oh, okay, we're actually looking at a lot of changes yeah. here. And obviously yeah. with the variants of concern that, that have been identified, um, there's been some really interesting work showing, you know, specific mutations that are associated with higher transmissibility, um, potentially the, the ability to evade antibodies, yeah. things like that. Um, so I think that that work is really important, but yeah, it's, it's layered into a lot that already needs to be done. And again, I think that to, to further plug the point you were making, you know, when we, when we can do this just as a normal surveillance and not in a moment of crisis, that really gives us a lot of information to work with then once we do have a crisis. Yeah. So do you think we'll continue watching the, you know, whatever this coronavirus turns into after everyone is vaccinated, which is perhaps a hope in itself that's a little bit far off, but. I think the, the wildlife disease ecologists uh, want you to watch it. <laughs> I, I hope someone I will. I think that was the mistake we made, you know, initially. And what do you think we could do better in, in the future? I know I, I'll mention that. Uh, ProMed, the program for monitoring emerging diseases, uh, started out actually as a network of laboratories, about 60 or so around the world. Then we discovered we didn't have any way to communicate. So in fact, it was Josh Letterberg who shamed me into getting on email, which was very punishing in the early 1990s, nothing like what we're doing now. Uh, and, um, you know, it took hours to, to format and you were lucky if you got an email within 24 hours, but we got all these people on email and then it sort of uh, evolved into a, a, an open source because it's really available to anyone at no charge. And it's a one health, uh, it, it's, it's one health focused as well, but an open source, you know, freely available, uh, discussion and surveillance system essentially for reporting disease outbreaks. And so they reported, ProMed Mail reported uh, SARS in China a few weeks before it came to Hong Kong. Although, you know, it seems to have been a surprise then. It reported MERS uh, when it was first identified, not in Jordan because uh, the capability to identify that as a unique virus. Perhaps there wasn't enough interest in, in uh, regional labs to, to do that. They knew it wasn't SARS, but later on it, it got you know, fully sequenced. And um, there was a, an item after it was first uh, reported from Saudi Arabia in ProMed mail. And this time ProMed had an item uh, that was uh, posted just before the outbreak uh, in Wuhan became public. And in fact, that's what got the WHO to call in Geneva to call the China office to find out what was going on. So obviously surveillance is necessary, but it seems not to be enough. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that that sort of collaborative spirit that you're talking about is so important. And I hope that that can continue. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, you were asking, me thoughts about how to handle it. And I think adding, layering in other people to collaborative efforts like that, I, I advocate a lot for working collaboratively with people from the places where you work, right? Or where I work. Um, and that doesn't just mean like the scientists in the capital at the university in the country where you're working, but it also means the people who are, who live right next to the forest, who maybe don't have, um, you know, any formal education, but actually know way more about the interactions with animals and seasick animals and, and, have a ton of information um, that we don't get when we just come in and do work. And so I think acknowledging different types of knowledge and how important that different type of knowledge is and working collaboratively all together, people from all different um, areas, I think that that can be really useful and that will help us to get even better information, right? Because really, yeah. People, if, if you have trained someone um, how to collect data or to notice different things, if you've had conversations with people about the things that they're seeing and you have a dialogue with them and then they feel comfortable talking to you when something happens and you're not there to see it, I mean, that can lead to a much faster response, obviously. Um, and just, and, and then the important thing is 
is to remember, remember that they are your collaborator. Once you know about something, you don't, you know, run in and, and fix it or do what you think is right, but actually incorporate everyone involved in the conversation about how to manage it and deal with it. And I, I think we would see a, a lot of better outcomes if we approach things that way. Yeah, we should combine forces, but also, you know, that inevitable plea for more investment. I mean, we do underinvest in public health and in a lot of the disease ecology and a lot of the work you're doing, I'm sure it's not easy to get funding. Uh, no. <laughs> people say, what, what's the relevance, right? But of course it's relevant. We see the effects right, right now. Are there more questions from the audience? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't seen any more in the chat box. So if anyone wants to speak up. <laughs> Well, I'll join you guys. Okay, um, thank you, Menon. Good to see you back. <laughs> yeah, so th there are a couple more questions. We're actually up for time, and dare I say it, um, your passion is infectious, and uh, we could yeah. probably go on for a long time. Um, but just a, a couple of quick questions. If you could wave the magic wand, the proverbial magic wand, what would you like to solve overnight? And I'll put it to both of you. I can go first. I mean, I, uh, yeah. it's pretty clear. I would, uh, I would change the way we interact with nature. I would, I would change how much we use of the earth um, and yeah, that, that's the magic thing I would do. I think that that would have cascading effects that improve all sorts of things, including this current pandemic. Well, I have to agree with that. I mean, you know, d definitely we, we can see what we've done to the environment and, you know, what we could do and what the environment could be like if, if we were more respectful. So I definitely agree with that. I, I think closer term, you know, what worries me about our current uh, response is just complacency. Uh, we tend to be very complacent about these infections until it's too late. Uh, and maybe we're complacent about what we're doing to the environment. I wish we had better ways of producing protein, uh, protein-based foods for people so we don't have to cut down uh, all the land or go out and hunt wildlife, people, people going out and hunting wildlife or, or have uh, industrial scale farming. And uh, it would be good, I think, if, you know, obviously we didn't need extractive industries, as Krista pointed out, they have a big effect. Although I hope there aren't any oil and gas people, fossil fuel people who are <laughs> listening. <laughs> they can just well, fund our research and yeah, they yeah. they'll build good, there good you go. rapport. Good thinking. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, there, there is there's just another question that popped up. I think we should take it. Um, here it goes. Are there any open source software projects addressing these issues? I'm sure there are, and I do not know off the top of my head of what to suggest. Steve, what do you have for that one? Well, you know, I, I think it depends on, on what you're looking for. I will say that in addition to the vaccine technologies that, you know, this pandemic has really pushed forward to maturity. And, uh, you know, maybe that's the silver lining in, the, in these dark storm clouds. Sorry for the cliche. There's also been a lot of, of you know, data science effort and other efforts like Johns Hopkins um, CSSE, you know, to try to collect these data and interpret them. So there are a lot of these, these efforts, uh, in, including uh, Next Strain, for example, to try to look at and, and pangolin as it's called with uh, evolutionary biologists trying to look at uh, the known and perhaps future strains or future mutants and variants of uh, the coronaviruses. Maybe that'll grow into something that biologists and data scientists could work together on. But I think there've been a lot of things that have been done, I guess is a question of you know, what people want to do with it, but there's been a real role for data science and, and ProMed, you know, there are a lot of these sources now to find out information on outbreaks. Right, right. What about the, in your field? Oh, sorry, go I'm ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're, you, yeah, you did a great job. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just back up everything. Okay. Said. <laughs> <laughs> and let us finish not too far past time. Thank you. Right, right. 
Um, no, as I said, we, we would love to go on. But um, before I make a little bit of a public service announcement, um, again, thank you to both of you um, for sharing your knowledge and your insights. And um, anything you would like to add um, as, as we wrap up? For me, I mean, it's been such a pleasure talking with Steve. I, I, I think this has been great. And I, I mean, I think that our work is, uh, we realized that we have so much overlap in our conversations leading up to today. Um, so it's been a real pleasure. And I, I really thank you for inviting me and, and for the audience for coming. Um, I'm really happy that we got to share this information. And I think it's a discussion that needs to continue and you know we should be thinking about these things and how there's so much great opportunity for innovative collaboration and I hope that this conversation helps encourage more of that. Well, thank you I agree with you 100% I want to it's really been a, a pleasure and if it weren't for this we probably wouldn't have had a chance to meet each other here since nobody's going to meetings anymore uh, where we might otherwise meet. So it's really a pleasure, uh, likewise, to meet you and talk with you and uh, discover our uh, interests in common and how much they overlap. But also thank you, Menon, and thank Polyplexus for bringing us together and bringing this group together. Thank And sincere thanks to all of you who've been listening through all of this and paying, you know, obviously, um, and asking questions and thinking about this. I think it'll take a lot of thinking for all of us to get out of this situation. So thank you. Thank you, our pleasure. We would love to have you back in any type of capacity. And um, so I have a quick announcement to make and uh, I think it's, it's a perfect segue because tonight's discussion certainly drives home the need for cross-disciplinary thinking and research as we take on the challenges of the future. To that end, we are excited to announce Conjecture Mania, which will yeah. kick off on April 5th. Um, for more information, you can check us out on Polyplexus or follow us at Polyplexers on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. We would love to have you join the conversation and, of course, Conjecture Mania. Thank you again, Krista, Steve. Until 